Hello, I'm Kyle Brinkman, and I'm doing a four-part series called Astronomy in the Bible. So you know a little about me. Uh, I am a scientist. I have a, a degree in physics from Florida State University. I ran the uh, Pat Thomas Planetarium there for two years. I'm a lifelong amateur astronomer, uh, former president of uh, the St. Petersburg Astronomy Club, and by profession, I'm a pharmaceutical scientist. I'm also uh, a member of the Presbyterian Church USA, an elder in that church since, uh, uh, well, 98, a Sunday school teacher and a missionary. The course uh, consists of four parts, creation in the calendar, the Old Testament astronomy, the Star of Bethlehem, and New Testament astronomy. In our culture, we have a constant debate over um, the Earth's origin and for that matter between science and faith and matter uh, people tend to subscribe to one or the other the reality is it is not that black and white most christians are not literalists uh, literalists as uh, the bible says this is the way it is if that's it i believe it and no amount of facts or evidence can dissuade me otherwise the others uh, say they want to believe in science um, they make the claim that uh, you know God is inactive, God doesn't exist, all faith is false. We had a, a debate some time ago between Bill Nye the science guy and the founder of, and curator of the uh, Creation Museum and that was a, a big example of today's battle. But the reality is these two camps are a false argument. Neither of these is right. You do not have to be an ignoramus to believe in God or to believe in science. Uh, you do not have to be a faithless person to believe in science. Uh, many scientists I know in my career are faithful people. Not all are Christians, some are Muslims, Jews, others, but uh, their faith also uh, did not prohibit them from pursuing academics and science. The fact of the matter is, God gave us science. If we turn to scripture and we see what uh, wisdom consists of, uh, we turn to Solomon, the wisest person in the Bible. In there, in the first Kings chapter three, it says, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. And what does that mean? We go on to chapter four and we find it described. He described plant life from the cedar of Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of walls. He also taught about animals and birds and reptiles and fish. Men of all nations came to listen to Solomon's wisdom, sent by the kings of the world uh, who has heard his wisdom. The truth is, Solomon was talking about biology, botany, animal husbandry, you know, uh, agriculture. All of these things that were very important in his day and age. And what we know is, in later on, that became known as natural philosophy and ultimately what we'd call today science. When we look into astronomy in the Bible, the very first mention comes on the fourth day of creation. On the fourth day, God created the stars. And it says here, and God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky uh, to separate the day from the night and let them serve as signs to mark the season and the days and the years and let them be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth. Before people were put on the earth, God thought to make seasons, days, years, in essence the calendar. Also, he expected people would study them so they were put there to, as markers, of course you're expected to look at them. Again, the, uh, the church, and I speak of uh, the Roman church as 90% of the world's Christians, um, and their leader, uh, while not Presbyterian, um, had some interesting things to say. Science itself is good since it is knowledge of the world which is good created and regarded by the Creator with satisfaction, as the book of Genesis says. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. 
I am very attached to this first chapter of Genesis. Original sin has not completely spoiled the original goodness. Human knowledge of the world is a way of participating in the Creator's knowledge. It is therefore a first degree of man's resemblance to God, an act of respect towards him for everything that we discover pays tribute to that basic truth. Pope John Paul II. Now, to be clear, there are two words that uh, come to mind when people talk about the study of the stars. One is astrology, and the other is astronomy. On the left, you have an astrologer. Tarot cards, pendulums, uh, zodiacs, uh, reading, your, uh, uh, reading your signs in the stars. You can do the same with a bus schedule that is not scientific, and that's witchcraft and forbidden by the Bible. It's called divination. On the right, uh, you have a, uh, a curator on the, the Mount Wilson Observatory pointing out the 100-inch Hooker telescope. That is for the study of the stars, a scientific endeavor completely void of any witchcraft. So what does the Bible say about astrology? Astrology, fortune-telling. Uh, he did away uh, with idolatrous priests appointed uh, by the kings of Judah to burn incense on the high places of the towns of Judah and on those around Jerusalem, those who burned incense to Baal, to the sun and moon, to the constellations and to all the starry hosts. In Micah, I will cut off witchcraft out of thine hand, and thou shalt have no more soothsayers. Deuteronomy, let no one be found among you who sacrifices his son or daughter in the fire who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft, or casts spells, or who is a medium or spiritist, or who consults the dead. In every case, fortune-telling by astrology uh, is uh, forbidden uh, in the Bible. That is not to say pagan practices don't exist today. The, uh, the moon, the stars, and all uh, that's found up in the heavens uh, these are not to be objects of worship. These things, anything that fell from the sky, is intended to be studied. It's an object. Uh, it has no uh, value as something to be worshipped. So in the beginning, what happened? There are a couple different lines of thought on this. In our Bible, uh, we have created a timeline. And this timeline uh, came to us uh, first in the 16th century. Uh, this is not a Jewish tradition. This did not come from the Bible itself. Uh, this came from a man named James Usher, a 16th century uh, Irish clergyman. Now Usher, whose uh, position as Archbishop, uh, made him head of the Church of Ireland, uh, published two works in the 1650s. Uh, he used genealogies from the Bible to date the creation of the world to October 23rd, 4004 BC. All right. If you look in your study Bibles, you will find this timeline or something very close to it in there, uh, pointing out uh, how the biblical dates and the the generations that are recorded in the Bible are used to come about these days. You will not find this in the uh, in the books of the canon. The Big Bang. How did that work? Uh, pictured here is the Hooker Telescope at the Mount Wilson Observatory. This 100-inch telescope was uh, the one that was used by Edwin Hubble when he uh, came out with the Big Bang Theory. Now, the uh, Big Bang is, is fairly simple. We saw that the, the, um, the universe is expanding, which means yesterday it was closer together. You run the clock backwards and all the way back to the Big Bang, uh, to where if it was all going farther apart now, it was all closer together and closer and closer still the farther back you look. So the order of creation. In the Bible, heaven, earth, light. Day two, the atmosphere. Three, land, sea, plant life. Day four, the sun, moon, stars. Five, animals. Six, humanity. And on the seventh day, God rested. According to the Big Bang, we have uh, 
Well, we don't know what happened before the Big Bang. There's no way to find out. But once it occurred, about 14 billion years ago, plus or minus 4.5 billion, then you get star formation, star death. Our own solar system formed about 4, four to 5 billion years ago. You get the land, the sea, the life on uh, land, simple cells, fish, plants. Monkeys show up about 60 million years ago, humanity 200,000 years ago, and recorded history about 8,000 years. These two uh, timelines uh, are very much um, not reconcilable. While the general um, outline is similar, where Earth came and then everything on it, uh, the, uh, the timelines themselves uh, aren't even close. So which method should we use if we're going to be uh, faithful disciples? James Usher, a man whose, um, whose entire works appear in the commentaries, or uh, we turn to that first chapter of Genesis which uh, we find the command to use the stars to mark our calendars and years and seasons. In this, I would say, uh, the Bible would uh, say to use the Big Bang, where we looked at the stars and we saw what the stars tell us. So, in conclusion for this part, uh, the world was made for supporting human life, God wants us to learn about his creation, and people are just plain crazy. What about the calendars? Those signs to mark the years and days. And this, uh, our calendar as we know it consists of the 12 months of varying uh, lengths, 31 to 28 days, uh, all very familiar. Our solar system we know uh, that the Sun is the center of our solar system. The planets Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Earth, Neptune, Uranus, and Pluto were n unknown at the time of the, uh, the writing of the Bible and to all our ancient cultures because those lie just outside the limits of uh, what your eye can see. Early on, we believed in a uh, geocentric uh, solar system where the Earth was the center. Uh, from the Earth, we saw that different objects moved at different speeds, and we assumed that the faster moving items were those that were closest to us. The Moon, Mercury, Venus, the Sun, then Mars, um, Jupiter, and Saturn. All of those objects went around this line called the ecliptic. On the ecliptic, you have the stars that mark the zodiac. The Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, uh, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius, Pisces, and so on. You also had some natural phenomena that were handy for marking times. The lunar cycle, for instance. In the lunar cycle, you have a, a time frame of uh, 29 and a half days. So 28, 30 days, somewhere in there, you have a, a nice steady time frame. Now, what were other cultures doing, uh, the ancient ones that were around our, our Jewish forefathers? Well, the Egyptians, they had 12 months. They had 30 days uh, per month based on the position of the sun in the constellations found on the ecliptic, the zodiac. So they had the month of Taurus, they had a month of um, uh, Scorpio, and so on. But that doesn't add up to an entire, um, entire year. There should be 365 days, and of course leap years. So uh, what they did, they had the 30 days based on the zodiac, uh, they had a 10 day week, uh, and they also had at the end of the year four to five holy days outside of the rest of the months. That kept their seasons in check. They um, had repeatable uh, uh, seasons with uh, months, and it worked out well for them. The Babylonians, another uh, neighbor of our Jewish uh, forefathers, uh, they used a lunar calendar. So they had 12 lunar months and a bonus month 
where they change the, the length every so often. Seven days in a week, and according to them, the seventh day of the week is the evil day. So what do the Jews uh, do? The Hebrew calendar, uh, they gave each month a name, varying length, mostly uh, mostly lunar based, 29 and a half days, so 29 or 30 in alternating uh, amounts, adding up to 355, 354 days in a year. This does not equal a, uh, a solar cycle, which would mean these months would rotate throughout the year. <clears throat> Interesting is that uh, when they named the days of the week on the seven day calendar, it translates Yom Rishon to first day, Ram Shetni, second day, third day, fourth day, sixth day, seventh day. It, they have no other meaning. They're not linked to uh, animals, people, uh, or foreign gods. They're festivals. Uh, these are based on the lunar calendar. They have either the first day of the month, 15th day of the month, or 17th or 10th day of the, of the month. Um, and nicely marked on a lunar cycle, uh, they show up and you know uh, that um, you know the Passover always happens on a uh, on a new moon or not a full moon. So what were the uh, the neighbors doing? Everyone else around them. When they went to name their days, you know, we have Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Interesting. They are associated with planets, and if we look at the uh, the roots of the English language, we know it's a blend of Latin and of Germanic languages, uh, and the uh, the Latin takes a lot of their words out of the Greek. So, uh, solus, well, and helios don't add up, but uh, sonatag, uh, Germanic uh, <coughs> uh, word, is for the sun. Moon, Mars, is Tuesday. <clears throat> Wednesday, Mercury, Thursday, Jupiter, Friday, Venus, Saturday, uh, Saturn. Interestingly enough, all of the, uh, the planets uh, known to early people. And of interest, the, uh, the Greek, Roman, and Germanic languages, and now English, all carry on the Babylonian tradition, declaring the Jewish Sabbath to be the day of evil. Curiously, God Kronos, an evil uh, titan uh, who Zeus had killed, translates to Saturn or Sotendag, an evil deity in Norse mythology. So, in the end, uh, even the, today's calendar is in fact anti-Semitic. And that's what we've learned about uh, going back and checking out the uh, the calendar and how it relates uh, from the stars to the Jewish calendar to our calendar today. Thank you.